The 1800s were a weird time to be alive. The Industrial Revolution was at its height, science and technology was breaking new grounds, and people had more access and exposure to other countries and cultures more than ever before. And it also seems like a new religious cult was popping up every week. Today I want to talk about the leader of one such cult, as well as one of her followers. Now I'm sure we've all heard of crazed and sensational criminals like Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac Killer, but I don't think many of you have heard of the woman known as the Yorkshire Witch. Now would you believe that a single woman was not only responsible for a career of theft and fraud, but was also involved in a doomsday cult, and she committed murder by the way of witchcraft? Well, it's all true, such a woman did exist, and her name was Mary Bateman. Now Mary was born in the North Riding area of Yorkshire to a family of farmers. She learned to read and write by age 13, and at age 20 she moved to York and began working as a dressmaker. During this time, Mary was part of a burglary and was forced to flee to Leeds, where she began to gain a reputation as a fortune teller and wise woman. During this time, she met and married John Bateman and took to crime once again. Mary was part of multiple robberies, but was able to escape punishment every time by bribing her witnesses. Some of her other crimes included performing back alley abortions and collecting money under the guise of taking donations for the victims of a fire, only to keep all the money and goods for herself. Now this sort of activity continued for about a decade until Mary was introduced to the Southcottian sect, which was a doomsday cult centered around the teachings of Joanna Southcott, who I will talk about a little bit more later. After joining the sect, Mary soon discovered that three of her hens were laying eggs with messages predicting the end times. Phrases such as, Jesus is coming, were appearing on the shelves, so Mary started publicizing this phenomenon of what she called her prophet hens, and it got her a lot of attention, both for herself and the South Cotian sect. But with popularity comes scrutiny, and it was later discovered that the whole thing had been a hoax. Big surprise, right? See, it turned out that Mary had been etching the messages herself, using a weak acid to write the words, and then reinserting the eggs into the hens. From what I could gather, Mary did this on her own and not at the behest of the South Cotians. It seems like she went kind of from scheme to scheme trying to get attention or money or whatever, but regardless, Mary's career of lies and swindling was far from over as shortly after this egg incident, she was approached by William and Rebecca Perigo for her alleged mystical healing abilities. You see, Rebecca had been suffering from chest pains and Mary claimed that it was the result of a curse. Mary began a unique form of treatment on Rebecca, taking large sums of money and personal belongings from the Paragos as payment, and then feeding Rebecca a magical pudding that she claimed was part of this cure. This went on for two years, with Rebecca's condition continually worsening until eventually she did unfortunately die from her condition. Heartbroken and furious, William accused Mary of poisoning his wife and defrauding them of money and property in return for phony charms and cures. An investigation later revealed that Mary had indeed been stockpiling money and belongings from the Perigos, as well as several other people that she had been scamming. See, Mary had indeed been lacing her special pudding with poison, keeping her victims sick so that they would keep coming back. Mary was quickly arrested and sent to trial, where she was quickly found guilty of theft, fraud, and murder. But after being sentenced to execution, Mary revealed that she was 22 weeks pregnant and thus could not be executed. The judge ordered a thorough examination of Bateman from a panel of 12 women, and they found that Mary was yet again lying and was, in fact, not pregnant at all. She was hanged shortly after her trial, leaving her husband and two daughters behind. But the sensation of Mary Bateman did not die with her. Soon after her execution, Mary's body was put on public display, and tickets were sold for a dissection demonstration and lecture by William Hay, a surgeon at the Leeds General Infirmary. Strips of her skin were also preserved into leather, which was later sold as magic charms and wards against evil spirits, and at least two books were also bound in her skin. But both books had been missing since the mid-1800s. Her skeleton is also currently on display in the Thackeray Museum of Medicine, and if you're a bit squeamish, you might want to look away for a few seconds because I am going to show a picture of it. I know it's a bit morbid, but the fact that her remains are still being used today as an example of medical research from that time is kind of cool. Now, a piece by journalist William Knight suggests that Mary was addicted to crime, and several historians have suggested that Mary suffered from some sort of psychological disorder that motivated her life of crime and pathological need 
to lie and steal. Now, while Mary's life is certainly an interesting and bizarre case on its own, the craziness that was her later years was influenced in part by the teachings of another woman that I mentioned earlier, the self-proclaimed prophetess, Joanna Southcott. As I hope you'll come to see, the life that Joanna led, as well as the legacy that still survives today, is pretty weird. Now, Joanna was born and raised in Devon County of Southwest England. She worked various service jobs until her early life, until eventually becoming a domestic servant. But she was later dismissed when a footman accused her of going mad after she rejected his advances. Men, right? In 1792, Joanna left the Church of England and joined the Wesleyan movement. She quickly began to claim that she had supernatural gifts and was able to give prophecies in the form of dictated poems. She also claimed to be the woman of the apocalypse described in Revelations 12. Such declarations gained Joanna her own following and she eventually caught the attention of William Sharp, who was a craftsman in London. Together, the two created and began selling slips of paper that they called the Seals of the Lord, and people could buy them for around 12 shillings and thus gain a place among the 144,000 people that Joanna claimed would be chosen by God to gain eternal life. Over the years, the spectacle of Joanna Southcott gained her over 100,000 devotees, including Mary Bateman. By the age of 64, Joanna claimed that she had been chosen to give birth to the second Messiah. Now, she had apparently developed a medical condition that made her appear pregnant, and so it's kind of easy to see why her followers might have thought she actually was. I can't say for sure whether or not Joanna herself truly believed that she was pregnant, or if she was just playing it off to maintain her position, but all the same, she and her followers prepared for this miraculous pregnancy, and the arrival of who they claimed was the fulfillment of a veiled prophecy in Genesis. So the date that Joanna set for this miraculous birth came and went, and of course, there was no new Messiah, and Joanna had in fact not been pregnant at all. Which I have to wonder if this whole fake pregnancy thing was a common practice among the South Cotians, or if both Joanna and Mary did it out of pure coincidence, but who knows. The failed arrival of the miracle child brought a lot of ridicule to Southcott and her followers, but they still hung on to the hope that Joanna's promises would still somehow carry through. Unfortunately, Joanna's condition worsened after the failed miracle pregnancy, and so she took the opportunity to compile some of her revelations and teachings and sealed them away in a box. She gave special instructions that the box could only be reopened during a time of great crisis, and only in the presence of all 24 bishops of the English church. Joanna died soon after, around December 26th of 1814, and it's speculated that her followers waited to announce her death because they believed that she would resurrect. This, of course, also didn't happen, but the South Cotians held onto her body until it finally started to decay, and then they were forced to go and bury her. Although she was dead, the movement that Joanna Southcott created was far from over. Many of her followers spent a considerable amount of time, money, and effort to preserve her teachings for the first half of the 19th century, and various individuals tried to take up the reins over the group after she died. One such man was John Ward, who appointed himself as a new prophet and Joanna's rightful successor. The problem was, John Ward was not a South Cotian. You see, John was a very theologically confused individual. He was raised as a Calvinist and then attempted to become a Methodist for his wife, then disavowed religion altogether and then circled back around and converted to a Baptist. Shortly after Southcutt's death, John read her book, The Fifth Book of Wonders, and was fully taken by what it had to say. He decided that he wanted to start sharing Joanna's teachings, and so he returned to the Methodist church to preach what he had learned. They quickly labeled him as a heretic and kicked him out. And so he went back to what remained of the South Cotians, but they wouldn't accept him either. He eventually crossed paths with a woman named Mary Boone, and together they came to the realization that Mary was in fact Joanna Southcott reincarnated, and that John Ward was her ultimate prophet. Without the ability to read or write, Mary would dictate prophecies to Ward, who would copy them down and circulate them around London in little pamphlets. He also claimed to have started receiving visions and was being visited by Southcutt's spirit. Ward's wife and family were rightfully convinced that Ward had lost his mind. They voiced their concerns to the local parish, who brought him before the local magistrate, who then determined that he was indeed off his noodle and sent him to an institution. And when he was finally released, John Ward said that he was a new man. But not in the sense you'd think. Instead, John changed his name to Shiloh Zion and went around saying that he was the new messiah. Now miraculously, Ward still maintained a following and they helped him distribute pamphlets and tracts and he made various appearances and speeches all throughout England. 
While trying to spread his teachings in Derby, Ward and a follower got into a conflict with the local clergyman, which resulted in Ward's companion assaulting the man. The two were promptly arrested and imprisoned for several months. When he was finally released, Ward traveled back to Bristol to start preaching again, but he suffered a massive paralytic stroke only a little while after starting his ministry back up, and he died only two years later. Ward was often described as a pleasant man, well-spoken and quite persuasive, which is probably why, despite his obvious delusions, there were still some people that supported him. Now, remember a while back when I mentioned that box of doomsday instructions left by Joanna Southcott? I'm sure you're all wondering what became of it. The Southcottians had kept a low profile since Joanna's death, but they continued to spread her teachings all throughout England. A woman named Mabel Barltrop learned about all this, and she felt inspired to go join what was left of Joanna Southcott's disciples. The Southcottians quickly decided that Mabel had been sent to them to be their new prophet, and they renamed her Octavia Shiloh. They even went so far as to restructure their view of the Holy Trinity to be God the Father, the Holy Spirit Mother, Jesus the Son, and then finally, Octavia the Daughter. Octavia even went on to restructure the entire group, renaming themselves the Community of the Holy Ghost and relocating to her hometown of Bedford. Octavia convinced the group that Bedford was the original location of the Garden of Eden and was therefore the perfect place to await the second coming of Christ. During this time, Octavia would set aside daily time to enter a trance-like state to allow herself to be led by the Holy Spirit to copy down various prophecies. These writings of the Holy Ghost were then compiled and distributed around London. Also around this time, the group renamed themselves again to the Panacea Society. Octavia Barltrop also began an endeavor that she called the Healing Mission, in which people from all over the world could receive pieces of linen that she had breathed on, which the person would then put into water that they would drink or wash with, and they would eventually be cured of whatever their illness was. There were several thousand people, at least, that did this, but don't worry if you think this was some snake oil scheme for Octavia to get money, because she provided the service free of charge. Now, one of the big things that Octavia focused on during her stint as leader of the society was Joanna Southcott's box. As a reminder, this box was a sealed wooden chest filled with various prophetic declarations that Southcott said were meant to guide people during a time of great crisis. She maintained that the box could only be opened in the presence of all 24 active bishops of the Church of England, and only then after they had spent a considerable amount of time reviewing her teachings. With events like the Crimean War and World War I being fresh in everyone's memory, Octavia believed that it meant Jesus was coming back soon and that there was no better time to open the box. So she and the rest of the Panacea Society began a campaign to do so, making all sorts of propaganda, including posters and holding demonstrations with the hope that the 24 bishops would listen to them. The group even bought an old boarding house and converted it to a compound to host the 24 bishops, complete with a special room to hold the ceremony of opening the box. Of course, the bishops paid them no attention, and surprise, surprise, Jesus didn't come back either. But Octavia explained this away by saying that her late husband was actually the second incarnation of Jesus, and so the third coming of Christ was soon to come. Some people just really don't know when to give up, do they? In 1927, a paranormal researcher named Harry Price claimed that he had acquired the real box of prophecy, and he arranged to have it opened, but only by one Anglican bishop. When they opened the box, they found that it only contained scraps of paper, a few lottery tickets, and a racing pistol. Octavia and the Panacea Society claimed that the box was a fake, and that the real box remained hidden in their possession. Octavia would later die in 1934 from complications with diabetes, but like with Joanna Southcott, her followers believed that she would resurrect. They finally called the Undertaker after three days, and she is buried with around 100 other members of the group in Forster Hill Road Cemetery in Bedford. Now, incredibly enough, the story doesn't stop there. In 1957, what was left of the Panacea Society claimed that they had rediscovered Joanna Southcutt's box, and they instantly began campaigning to assemble the 24 bishops and have it finally opened. This still did not happen, but the Panacea Society continued their quest to open the Box of Prophecy even into the 1970s, claiming that if the box remained unopened by 2004, humanity would be forced to face apocalyptic destruction without Joanna Southcutt's wisdom. Today, the Panacea Society is no more, as the group lost its status as a religious community in 2012 with the death of its last original member. It has since been reorganized into a charity organization dedicated to serving the Bedford area, which, remember, the society originally believed was the true lost location of the Garden of Eden. 
As for Joanna Southcutt's Box of Prophecy, it remains sealed and unopened to this day and can be seen on display at the Panachea Museum. Now, there are actually two religious groups that still follow the teachings of Joanna Southcott to this day, those groups being the Christian Israelite Church in Australia and the UK, and then there's the House of David Commune in Michigan. So yeah, that's the story of Joanna Southcott and Mary Bateman. Um, I had originally planned to only talk about Mary and the whole prophet chicken hoax, but in reading about her life, I found out about Joanna Southcott and the rabbit trail that that all led to, and so I thought it was too interesting not to share. I'm always fascinated to learn about the more fringe religious groups and the people that lead them, because as a Christian myself, I would like to think that I have a pretty decent understanding of the Bible and what it teaches, and so I always find it really baffling how some of these people come up with crazy interpretations and ideas of what it all means. I find that sort of stuff really interesting, and so hopefully by my sharing it, you will too. The people I talked about today are by no means the first or last people to be involved in crazy fringe religious movements. So stay tuned and I will hopefully be able to talk about a few more. I'd love to hear what y'all think and what or who else I should talk about in a future video. But with that said, thank you for watching. I really do appreciate the support. And maybe if I get enough followers, I can start my own doomsday cult in the next video.